Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Nå, skal vi øh, fyre den af? Jeg tror, alle er danske her, ser det ud til. Så indtil videre, så kan jeg... Ja, yeah, I, I, I know. I think everybody here is, is Danes, but uh, Rasmus will... Uh yeah, are we, is there anybody here who don't understand Danish? Oh, good. Yeah, let's do it in English then. Good. Okay. So I'm here on behalf of the organization against illegal data retention, which is uh, ulovlig lockning, we call it in Danish. And it's uh, an organization we've set up in order to file a lawsuit against the Danish government for the illegal data retention, which is a constant, constant surveillance of all mobile phones, as you probably all know. Whenever it interacts with the network, it is logged. And that log is then kept for more than five years. And the police will always be able to go in, check out, ooh, where have you been? Where are you going? And what are you going to do about it? Um, it's an unfortunate uh, situation because the police can use it to convict people of things they haven't done and you can't use it to be acquitted for something you haven't done. Because if you say, oh, no, 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 I, it could, this couldn't have been me because my phone was lying at home, well, that's proof that you planned this crime. So that's sort of... And it's, it's a simple case because it's already been ruled illegal by the European Court of Justice. And that's what we're doing. We're trying to make that apply in Denmark as well. So what I'm going to do today is talk more generally about human rights and constitutional law and how we've gotten into this situation and how we can apply it for new things. If we look at the division or separation of powers, then we have classic sort of parliament creating a framework that government then has to fill in and the courts sort of monitoring what's going on And there's a lot of things involved in this. It's not as simple as such because they do have specific prerogative. Um, they can do some things, some things they can't do, and we'll get into that. Um, this one is the Danish situation is a bit unfortunate. The parliament decides who's the government, and the members of the government can be a member of parliament at the same time, and it's the members of government who appoint new judges without any parliamentary oversight. We are sort of very proud of our democracy in Denmark and ooh, we're this democratic state and we're the pearl of the world and other bullshit. And we 
we do talk about this, but mainly in sort of in uh, legal and economic contexts. So the people who will know about this are sort of jufa, as we call them in Danish, which are jurists and uh, and economists. And it's been a big thing, uh, not in the main <laughs> stain media, but in uh, in in sort of in in um, in legal do- uh, magazines. We talked about this for years. Uh, parliaments had sort of reports drawn out of the fact that all of the judges come from a career in the government, and and people don't really care. So that's sort of that's a difficulty we have in Denmark, and we sort of have to always overcome whenever we want to go into the public with something that's well um, that's violating our rights as such. We have to sort of combat the fact that to a lot of journalists believe we are sort of this model of democracy throughout the world. What about the people in the separation of powers? Um, we have sort of a theory of how we get the people into it. Uh, you can see in parliament we have the elections and we have the ability to run for elections ourselves. In government there's the right to access documents. FOIA, Freedom of Information Acts, um, and in the courts we use people who aren't jurists and who are sort of members of the public as jurors. And you know that from American television shows, you have the right to be tried by a jury of your peers, and that's basically to say, okay, the the people, uh, the landowners, the people who have can afford it, have the ability to be in parliament, and the people have the ability to be in government but only people with a certain degree have the opportunity to become a judge. And to combat that and to try and make get the people into it, we've done this system where in, uh, in the criminal proceedings uh, and in criminal law, you will have uh, people who have no legal training sitting there. Separation of powers, uh, in practice, you know from something like the annual budget uh, in Danish finance law, that is a bill that any parliament with a separated powers have to pass every year because the government cannot use a single uh, unit of currency without having a law saying they're allowed to. And that's something we, we don't really think about because when we talk about the annual budget, it's always, oh, we're going to spend a billion on this and a billion on that. But it's quite important. This is a law that says everything the government is allowed to pay for, for a year. And, and that's, it's, it's quite substantial, and you can check it out on the internet, and you can sort of go down and see, oh, okay, okay so they have this amount of money for paper clips. Um, another one is the habeas corpus, which is the right to be faced uh, to go to a, uh, a court if you've been arrested. So if you've been arrested by the executive branch of government, or the government, then you have the right to see a member of the judicial branch to see a judge. In Denmark, that's one of the very few uh, good things we have in our constitution. This has to happen within 24 hours, and you appear before a judge in what's called a grundlovsforhør. And that's quite interesting because this isn't something that's that you see in other countries, and, and I don't really know where we've gotten the sort of the 24-hour thing, but in this one area, <laughs> we've gone a bit further than uh, the most other countries. And we also see um, the, uh, the, the separation of powers can sometimes be violated, and in Denmark we had a good example of it. There was a political um, majority in parliament who said, okay, this one school, Sweden, this one school is violating our rules, therefore they can no longer receive subsidies by the, uh, from the government. And that law was overturned by the courts because the courts went to parliament and said, no, it's not up to you to decide whether someone is breaking the law, that's up to us. So we have had sort of a concrete uh, example of the powers sort of, and the separation of powers eroding. We also have the prerogatives I talked about before, As you know, it's usually the king or the executive branch that make money, but with a certain parliamentary oversight. So in Denmark, we have Mundloven, and in in America, you have the central banks uh, in most countries. It is sort of, it's an odd construction because 
it is up to the king or the president to make the money, and Parliament sort of has to write a law that gives them the right to do so, but under certain circumstances, so you don't end up like Venezuela, where they have hyperinflation because they've kept on printing money. Another thing they can do is obviously the pardons. Uh, they can go to war. That was something I uh, was hoping Pierre Kovel would have been here because he's been involved in another lawsuit that went uh, less fortunate they lost because they filed suit against the government for entering into the Denmark into the Iraq war. And that was kind of a lost cause uh, from the beginning because that's one of the things that the executive branch can do is go to war because most uh, people, when they've written constitutions, have sort of decided, okay, we need the executive branch to have sort of a limber access to using the military. So if there's an army advancing on us, then they can use it without having to call in parliament from all parts of the country. Separation of powers and uh, Mr. Trump is sort of... I've taken Trump, which is sort of... A, it's unfortunate because it's the same in Denmark. And we see it with uh, our freedom of information, which is non-existing now. Uh, we've had a, a recent law, Offenders' Law, limiting it to almost no access to public information, whereas places like Finland, uh, you can get much better access. You can even go in and see, like, electronically access all the receipts of stuff bought by government, and that way you can sort of control what they're doing. And in Denmark, we have to rely on parliament asking questions, which is regulated in the Danish constitution, that they can. But now we have an <laughs> executive branch that won't even answer the questions of parliament, which is a massive problem, both for parliament and for the rest of us. I like this drawing of uh, <laughs> Lady Liberty and Trump wanting to attack her, but Justitia is defending her. Um, and that's what we're doing. That's both illegal uh, data retention and, and the other issues that POSA is, is involved in. We're using the courts because the courts are the only place where people like Trump and Pierre Kersko cannot be. We're using the meritocracy of the, of the civil court system to combat populism. And, and because we're doing that, that is obviously a democratic problem because that means we're sort of taking advantage of the fact that we have an education and we can do these things. But that's also why it's important and why I've decided to do this talk on the sort of the, fun, found, uh, the, um, the fundamental principles of having a constitution and what one does when you have one. The concept of the constitution in Denmark for fattening a grundlov, verfassung, is it's a contract between you, every one of you, and the concept of a state. I'm an anarcho-capitalist politically, so I don't believe the state has a right to exist. And that's basically it. This is a question, when we do this, when society comes together and decides we're going to have the ability to put people in prison or to kill people, what are the rules for setting up such a construct? And having been born into this like, to, uh, totalitarian state that I believe Denmark is, it, we don't get a lot of discussion about it. Everybody just assumes that, yeah, of course we have a government, of course we have a state, of course, yeah, churches, everything. But, but you need to look at the constitution to see what... You have to be level-headed enough to write a constitution that's going to stand the test of time. The Danish constitution was last in, uh, altered in, in 1953, and that was after the World War, but that wasn't the reason. The reason was because we had a female uh, child of the king, and if we, the, the then constitution did, wouldn't allow a woman to become queen of Denmark. And the guy who was then be, was next in the line of succession, he was quite ugly. And that's how we changed the constitution in Denmark. It's sort of, we've seen, and the 1953 constitution of Denmark has some amazingly necessary things. For instance, we saw what Hitler did in Germany, and we said, okay, fair enough, instead of him using the criminal system to try people, he just said, no, no. They're insane. 
and he did administratively what he couldn't do with the police. So all of a sudden you have this parallel police force, which is the, the psychiatric department. <laughs> um, and, and, and that gave us in, uh, in the Danish constitution a new rule saying that all of these must now also be able to go before a court. And that's quite important, but it's something we've also forgotten, uh, which is a for unfortunate. Now, Mr. Hitler and uh, his friends, I did, I, I formatted it so it would fit, but it doesn't, that annoys only me. But what we've seen both with this and with that is that the sort of totalitarian regimes can do a lot of bad things to a country and very few European states have a modern constitution. As I say, the Danish one is from 1953, and it's not like we did a complete overhaul. We just added a few things. But this, a lot of it is based on, on an idea that we cannot... It was written before phones. So that's why people like Trump get so much uh, power. It's because they were sort of expecting everybody to get on a horse and go back home every day. And sort of, you couldn't just phone up people and have a meeting. You couldn't do an online vote in parliament. And we need to do something about it. But before we can do that, we have the international uh, communities. So after the World War, the Council of Europe was set up. And the Council of Europe is a difficult one because it is not the Council of the European Union. Aha. This, this one is the Council of Europe, which is... Most of the European states, apart from uh, Belarus, including Russia, and they set up a place where they could come together and talk, and they wrote down what became the European Convention on Human Rights, which is one of the most important documents we have in the history of humankind, because it's, it's saved us from quite a lot of things since the World War. We had a lot of bad experience with charismatic leaders, and we took all of that and we made uh, a convention that is uh, protecting all of us. But there is a problem. If we look at the Danish part of the division of powers, it's over here. Then I've taken some random other European countries and put them in. And the, European, uh, the Council of, of Europe is, is uh, bilateral or it's, 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 uh, it's um, uh, it's, it's an international <laughs> cooperation, it's not a supranational. So it only acts as a place where people come together, but it has no actual power to force people to do things. So if, for instance, Denmark is found to be in violation of the European Convention on Human Rights, they, they can fine Denmark, but they cannot do anything about it. If Denmark doesn't want to pay the fine, there's nothing they can do. And that was why we also came up with this one, the European Union. Now that's a supranational, and that's what the nationalists don't like. That's like Nigel Farage and Pierre Gersko and whomever. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> they don't like the fact that, we, that the European Union can go in above the nation states and decide on their behalf. And it is quite strong. Yeah, we've given up some sovereignty to do this, but there is some merit to doing it in this way because the European Union has also now implemented the European Convention on Human Rights and they have the power to reinforce it. They have the power to uphold it. They have the power to go to a country like the UK. And this was one of the things in the Brexit vote. In the UK, prisoners aren't allowed to vote, which is a mental thought. And, and especially after the Second World War, we should all know how stupid that is. They had an election uh, after the Tottenham riots, and the Tottenham riots uh, began amongst the sort of the less fortunate mainly, and people were sent to jail for quite a long time. And with no fixed election date, you could do that. You can incite a riot, arrest everyone, and then hold, a le hold an election. And that's how you will win forever. So obviously, it's quite crucial that prisoners have the ability to vote, and that had been uh, the ruling of the European Court of Human Rights, but the United Kingdom wasn't having it. They're just saying, nah, 
prisoners shouldn't be allowed to vote. And that's when the European Union said, hang on a minute, we actually have the power financially to stop you. We can fine you so hard that it hurts because you're so dependent on us. Unfortunately, that sort of led to them deciding no longer to be a part of it. But the rest of us can sort of look at that and see, okay, so if Poland, we talk a lot about Poland and Denmark, if they're going to continue down this street of trying to mirror Danish politics, then there might be consequences. So we're using economy between states and, and supranational uh, organization to enforce it. And that's how we've gotten this art situation where it's actually the European Union protecting us from our government. This is a flowchart of how to go through whenever you hear about something new. Um, is this a violation? And is it a violation of human rights? Is it a violation of EU rights? And is it legal at all? And it's quite interesting, this one, because <laughs> with the illegal data retention, with our lawsuit, we've won already by the first one, because, and you gotta keep sort of <laughs> focus on this one, Denmark has decided to incorporate the European Convention on Human Rights into Danish legislation. So for the government to act in uh, violation of it is illegal under Danish law already. So the, that's how we can call it illegal data retention. It's because it is illegal. And obviously, no human rights will <laughs> allow a government to do anything illegal. But even if it weren't, then we will move on to number two. Is it regulated by the European Union? Because the European Union cannot do every, everything on every area. And in this case, it's uh, mobile phones and internet data retention, and that is a cross-border issue, so the European Union can rule on that. If they couldn't, we can just move on to the next one. Is there an infringement of a right? And in this case, it's a right to privacy, and obviously, yes, there is. So we can just go through the Council of Europe instead of the Council of the European Union. Last one, is there a legal, a legitimate, is there a reason for doing this in a democratic society? And we have that. For instance, if one of you is put to prison, set in prison, that is an infringement of your right to freedom. But then you have to look, have you done something that legitimizes the fact that the government is doing this? And if we try to apply this to something like our case, the data retention is illegal. Um, and that's our first point when we go to court. Because the European Convention on Human Rights is a part of Danish legislation, that is in and of itself, it's a violation of the separation of powers. This is a minister doing something parliament has told him not to, even if there is now a majority in parliament supporting him. Mobile phones and internet users does cross the borders and privacy is a human right. Therefore, we have all these, we can use Danish legislation, we can use the European Convention, and we can use the EU law to stop this. And that's why we're so certain we're gonna win, and it's just a question of time. But if we try to apply it to something else, like drones or surveillance planes in Copenhagen, those of you not from here, uh, <laughs> we've had a few years of massive surveillance from the sky. <sighs> The Danish Home Guard has bought some planes with some very big cameras on them, and the police love hiring them to fly around very slowly above us, keeping us awake at night, taking photos of us. And if we look at this, what, is, this the, is this legal? Now, everything the government does, it needs a warrant to do so in the law. There is no law giving them the permission to sort of to, to do it the way they do it. So we can sort of look at the, the hodgepodge of, of the, it's like, a, it's a blanket of, of different things that's been sewn together. And what they can do, yes, the home guard can fly around. And yes, the police can hire the assistance of the home guard to keep an eye on everything. Is that okay? Fair enough, that is sort of legal. But they've also bought this big camera now, do they have any right in law to use a camera to look down? Now, what's the difference between this and the police as they usually used to be or before they went to the sky? Well, the difference is now they can look down in people's back gardens. 
especially in Copenhagen, we have a lot of these sort of yards behind the buildings that the police can't see. A lot of buildings we've sort of we've used the attic spaces to new to do new apartments, and the police can't look in the window of a five-story flat. But they can now with a camera and a plane or a drone. And that is illegal for them to do. This is sort of where I got going on this entire uh, illegal uh, surveillance thing, is this using a drone or a plane is the exact equivalent of a police officer bringing a tall ladder, climbing up to fifth story and looking in the window. And they're not allowed to do that. And they're not allowed to do that because it's not legal, because parliament has not decided. We may get one of these. We may get a window people law, but then it would be legal. Now, is it a European Union issue? No, unfortunately not. Um, <laughs> it would be nice if it were, but, but this is sort of the act of living in our apartments, not sort of not very cross-bordery. So, but we have to go on, and we say, okay, is there an infringement on a right? Yes, privacy. And now we can debate, okay, is this necessary in a democratic society? It's very 1984, the, the novel uh, with a telescreen on the wall. We don't know if they're looking right now because they keep going in circles. So right now they might have a good view might, or it might just be in a five seconds. And that is obviously a problem. So it's illegal. Um, and how can I be so certain that it's illegal? Well, the minister told parliament. <laughs> I, I, I talked to a member of parliament and he uh, then went on to ask the minister, hey, when you're flying around taking photos of people, do you have any, uh, do you have any legal grounds to do that? And the minister said, nah, we don't. I just, and and I'm, 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 I spend my time we're sitting at home f phoning journalists and trying to explain this to them. How can you not see that this is a big deal? The minister says, well, uh, we have the right to see everything that can be seen from public road. And that's true. But what about the rest of it? Even if we were to say, okay, fair enough, here's a window pega law, and fair enough, this is in an area with a lot of crime, so it might be necessary for you to do this. Even in that case, it's only legitimate or it's only necessary for that one criminal. And unless he's building an army, you're going to get mostly non-criminal people. It, it, no, it, it, for every innocent person that is filmed, that's a violation that has no legitimacy. And that's something we need to look into. And, and it definitely is something we are looking into. And it will be something we will be uh, taking to court one time in the future. Another one, <sighs> DNA registries. These are loved by totalitarian regimes across the world, be mainly because they were CSI. But it's the same thing as the mobile phone. If you spit on the street, they have proof that it was you. And they have proof of sort of when it were. When were you there? And that can, again, mainly be used to punish innocent people. Because what the police can do if they have no suspects, they can just take all the swaps they want, get a list of people, and see who's the most easy to convict. And it's usually someone called Muhammad. And that's what they do. That's what they do with mobile phones. If there's a broken window, fair enough. Get me a list of all the people who've been here. There they are. Has any one of these been convicted before? Well, yes, Muhammad. We caught him last week. Oh, we didn't catch him. But last week, we picked him out of the same list for breaking another window. And now he's a criminal, sort of. So you can sort of... It becomes circular, and it's self-reinforcing. And that's definitely going to be a problem with the DNA registry. Also, it can be used to, for instance, if you, in the future we see, ah, you might have a cancer in, the f in, in your bloodline, in your DNA. You might have a risk of a cancer that takes quite a long time to kill you. And imagine if a future parliament decides, well, we're gonna, not going to spend time on 
and money on treating a cancer that's gonna sort of drag out for years. It has to kill you like within a year for us to want to care about it. And then we sort of begin looking at the apartheid, which went on for quite some time when Nazi Germany, the Eastern Bloc, you had a lot of this sort of, oh, this is not a good person. Why are we spending money on this bad person? In Denmark, we had it recently with the, while I was in France with someone called Robert, Dona Robert, which was a person <laughs> that the media decided, he's so lazy, why should we care about him? Why should we pay money to keep him alive? And that's one of the other big problems with having a DNA registry. But it's the debate. The smart meter, this is good. This one. We got one. And, and this is... This came just after the Minister of Justice changed his tune. Because the Danish Minister of Justice usually says, oh yeah, we're doing all this illegal stuff to catch uh, serious criminals and terrorists. And then one day he changed, well, very subtly. Oh yeah, we're doing all this to stop terrorism and social frauds. Benefit cheats. People who come here and take away our welfare. And then Parliament decided we should all be forced to have one of these. If you don't know what it is, it's a smart meter. It's like uh, the spinning disk you have in your apartment or house, and it measures how much current you use, or power, current or power, one of them, um, or the product of them. It doesn't matter. <laughs> what it can be used for is you can remotely monitor whether someone's in there and somewhat what they're doing. And imagine this in a social fraudster case. You're receiving benefits because you're on, uh, you, you, you stay at home, uh, you have had an operation, and you sort of, it, this is going to take some time for you to get back on your feet. However, every morning at nine, everything shuts off, and there's virtually no power drawn uh, between then and like four in the afternoon, five. Well, are you leaving your house to go to work? Are you sort of working off the books? Yeah, now you're going to have to explain this. If you sort of have uh, any kind of illness, and maybe you leave your house on a Sunday uh, at about 1 o'clock and come back at, at 7 in the evening, oh, so you could go to football, could you? You could go and see a match. And that's sort of, that's one of the many, many problems with the smart meter. The police can use it to draw up this imaginary tale, and not just the police, the executive branch, but also private companies, can draw up this imaginary every day for you and see, oh, he's been at home midday. Maybe that means he's doing so-and-so. And obviously that's a problem. This one, this model has many other problems, one of them being you can disable all power for a house with a remote control, uh, which is, it's, it's this, we're going to open this uh, and, and hack away at it, but there's a massive relay in it uh, where when applied, it poof, cuts the power. And that's perhaps not a human rights issue as much as it is his... Is if, when looking at it from a paranoid point of view, I'm thinking, well, that means that sort of if the police or someone wants to get in or wants to do something towards you, they can just click, power, gone. If you have like a, maybe a power lock on your door, that's an easy way to get in. But Mainly, uh, from a legal point of view, the problem with this is the ability to monitor what people are doing at all points, whenever they're home. So that's going to be interesting. The next one, the travel card. This one is already in effect. Uh, I have what I call a true and non travel I don't have it here. But there's only one place in Denmark where you can buy a, an anonymous travel card, and that's in Copenhagen. And every time you have to sort of top it up, you have to go to the same 7-Eleven in Copenhagen. And that's mental. That's the government. And it's also more expensive to use the anonymous travel card than it is to use one that's tied up to your name. And this is, this is much the same as the mobile phone, but 
where we also specify exactly what type of transport people are in. And if we apply this to an actual case, then there was a guy who did a simple replay attack. It's very easy to do. Anybody with a mobile a smartphone can do it. And, and there was a Swedish guy who just he'd, uh, bought it. He'd taken a copy of it. Now it has 200 Danish kroner on it. And then he'd, um, he'd used it. And then he'd reinstated the same the copy back when it had 200 on it because it doesn't query a central server to check its balance. And everybody with any sanity would say, well, that's a problem with the design of the solution. But the Danish courts, in all their wisdom, um, decided to say, oh, no, 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 this is very bad. And what the police had done, instead of just saying, okay, um, maybe give us a call next time he checks in and we'll send someone no, no. They said, okay, let him keep on traveling on this. And we can sort of get all the, the video recordings of him do it. And this is, that's an interesting concept now, because now we have the police saying, please continue to commit this crime so we have more evidence of you committing it. Is that, is that fair? in a democratic society? Uh, is that something we should do? We have uh, a lot of this debate about uh, the concept of, of agent provocateur, where you, so as police, go in and incentivize people to commit a crime in order to punish them for it. But this is sort of more, well, we have this shitty system, and we're just going to leave him do it, and tie it up on him, and then present to the court this massive film of him walking around using his travel card. And they can do that with us as well. Do we want that? Should we be able to access it? I'm at the moment having a, like a, a heated exchange with the, the, the Copenhagen Metro because uh, a cunt kicked me on the Metro one day and I, sort of, I wrote them, hey, I'd like a, the footage of that so I can see it like in Matrix uh, style where you sort of pan between all the cameras. And they sort of said, ah, nah, you can't have it. That's only for the police. And that's obviously illegal. So they said, oh, OK, you can have it, but you have to pay for us to have to blur everybody else. And I said, well, that's illegal too. And they said, yeah, OK, fair enough. And it sort of goes on on those lines. But the travel card has the ability, and we know this because uh, what they do is when you pay for it, if you, or if you top one up using a credit card, Reisecord, the business, has an exemption from the GDPR and the Danish rules that says, oh yeah, you can match up so, so you know whose credit cards have been used with this travel card. Now this uh, is interesting because they've gotten this um, sort of this exemption from the Minister of Justice. And as a Minister of Justice, member of the executive branch, he has to have a reason in law to do so. He has to have a legal grounds to do so, and he doesn't. So the, this is like a blind man walking around selling glasses. It, it's, it's, he's just saying, yeah, sure, yeah you, can, yeah, you can commit bank robberies if you want to. Yeah, yeah here's a letter, sure, do whatever. And, and, and that's a bizarre situation, and we're trying to do something about it. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, as you may have seen, we've set up uh, we, the, uh, the sale of these. We produce them ourselves. Uh, so most of it is child labor. Um, it's 200 kroner, and of those 200 kroner, all 200 go to the case against the Danish government. Questions? Let's give you a hand microphone. Thank you for the talk. I just had a quick question because I'm not very familiar with the Danish system, but uh, can you comment on uh, what's the state in Denmark in terms of uh, legislation of state trojan and ability for law enforcement to um, use software implants, trojans basically? Could, could you repeat, what's the, what's the state in Denmark? Yes. Okay, so from, from a legal perspective. Yeah, someone asked me about this yesterday as well. There, there's nothing forbidding it. Um, it's sort of, obviously, yeah, you're forbidden from, from uh, wreaking havoc on other people's machines, 
but mainly from from a vandalism point of view. Uh, and then you have the civil responsibility. So if they suffer a loss, that will be then levied onto you. But but is, are you, governments using Trojans towards the people? It's not something we. That's a good question. Let's let's do the uh, the checklist. Is it legal? I don't know. Okay. It, it, it's not something I've seen. Um, are they doing it? I was asked. Uh, I haven't seen it, but that doesn't mean they're not doing it. Um, I, no sorry. There, so it's not known if it's if they're using it, and there's no law that specifically allows them to no. use it or forbids them from using it. Uh, what would forbid them from using it would be the privacy. Uh, so through the European Convention on Human Rights. But okay. but yes, there is a. It, it, it sounds very much like the drone question. It's something people hadn't thought about, so now they're trying to patch it together from, from scraps they've found on the floor. Um, and and uh, It depends what they're using them for, but it would be a violation of privacy, uh, and that would be the main thing. But I, I haven't heard anything about them doing it, and it's just from all my experience with them, they're not technically competent to do well anything, really. So, so, but, but maybe there are, I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in Italy, where I come from, they most definitely are not technically competent either, but uh, uh, I can tell you they have been using those tools for, for over a decade now, um, and Germany similarly, and it's getting legislated pretty much all over the place. So it's quite surprising that uh, nothing is uh, happening here, which, I mean, it, I guess it's good news. It, yes, well, uh, as I say, I don't know that it exists. We have a problem in Denmark. One of the ma main problems with our constitution is that you cannot bring principal cases to court if you do not have a personal asset in it. And in this case with mobile phones, we all do. And in that case, depending on how the Trojans are spread, we could also have one. But we, we sort of need to prove the existence of a Trojan before we can do anything. But it's a good one, and, and I'll look into if Parliament has asked the minister. They haven't, as far as I know, but if they have, I'm fairly certain what he would have said is, we don't have the right to do so, but we do have the rights as set forth in the one law about how they can do. They would have likened this to, to, tapping, to wiretapping a phone, uh, and they would say, okay, fine, we can do this with judicial oversight. Yes, we have stickers as well. Uh, um, we have a wonderful little sticker that we sell. Uh, is it 50? Yes, for 50 corner of which 100% also goes to uh, to the case. Uh, it's beautiful. It's the logo, uh, ooh, and it's round. I don't have a sticker on stage, but go to Jeppe with the orange T-shirt, and he will definitely vend it to you. Any more questions? Anything else you wanna? Do the flowchart on. I, oh, I, I, I should have thought more about the Trojan thing. That's good. Yeah. I would be cool. It, it sort of, obviously, it'd be a problem, but it'd be cool to prove it. Yeah, let's find out. That's good. Yes. Um, I'm not sure what I'm asking here, but uh, <laughs> for example, we're on uh, Bornholm. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, we only have one communication cable connecting to Denmark. Uh, so surveilling that one line would be very easy. Uh, is the state doing anything to encrypt the information that is going on uh, to protect the privacy of the population? No. Uh, okay. Uh, it would be nice if they did, but the politicians haven't sort of understood the need for it and the executive branch hasn't taken any initiative. It's like with the Americas, where you see uh, some politicians saying, oh, encrypted messaging services, they're only for criminals. So explaining to parliament how it would be necessary to prove, uh, to sort of, to, to, to obfuscate or, or to, to, to encrypt uh, the communication of private citizens that would be quite the feat. Uh, that would be difficult. I know two parties are sort of thinking about wanting it. 
but the rest of them don't know what it is. Uh, I have a comment too. Yeah. Uh, on Bornholm, we don't have a uh, rice quarter. That's true, yeah. Which is mental in and of itself. And you can buy like a, a card from the, the bus driver, but not, but only pay in cash. It, it's a marvelous little fairy tale island. <laughs> uh, do you know whether the APNG, uh, the automatic number plate recognition, uh, oh yes, is the that uh, deemed illegal by the European uh, court as well? Not yet. It, 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 now this is interesting. Now we have the automatic number plate recognition system, which does the same thing as the travel card and the mobile phone surveillance. It, it, it just it surveils where are people and what time. And, and where they're going, and it's the same thing that happens. A lot of innocent people are in trouble because of it. However, we're quite late to the party in Denmark. Um, fr French police have had it for years, and in Denmark, it's not even sort of, it's, uh, it's been, well, a few years since I was last in a police car, but uh, uh, a Danish one, but the French ones um, have, like, it says, boom, Every time it scans a number plate and recognizes them, and then sometimes it if it needs to be stopped for like insurance or something, um, and and so um, in human rights we have the problem of things sort of becoming normal before they're ruled illegal, and the European uh, Court on Human Rights is always scared of uh, the ramifications of coming up with controversial in the eyes of the politicians. Uh, so, so that's why they've sort of, they've actually accepted some of the, the burqa bans and stuff like that. And I've had long debates with uh, fellow jurists specialized in this, and, and what they're saying is basically, yes, they could honor human rights in this area as well, but if they do, they will likely be defunded. So no, co no country would ever pay for them, and that would sort of stop the court's existence. And, and, and in Denmark, we've had the, the, the presidency of the Council of Europe, and we decided we were going to use it on limiting human rights. And, uh, and, they, yeah, and, and the Danish media said, oh, yeah, we're going to get that, finally, we're going to get on. Oh, oh. What? It's just, yeah, we're going to limit human rights. That's what we're going for. That was, that was the aim of the Danish presidency. So to, to your knowledge, is there any Danish political party that consistently votes in favor of either privacy or proper security for the citizens? No. No, the problem, uh, <laughs> that's sort of from one of the first slides, is the separation of powers uh, in Denmark. It is non-existent. So the government consists of members of parliament, and because of that, the members of parliament change opinion because they want to be in government because that's a higher salary. I uh, just uh, Googled a quick answer for you. <laughs> um, it seems like, indeed, they do actually use it, and... Um, as of 2015, who used what? I'm getting to it. Yes. From, from the hacking team, leak uh, documents confirmed that the Danish National Police uh, acquired a remote control system, which is the Trojan sold by hacking team for 4.2 million kroner, and that there were additional inquiries made with the company by the Danish Defense Intelligence Service. So, yeah. Yes. Cool. So we have bought some sorts of surveillance, but that doesn't mean they use them. But obviously, yeah. In a perfect world, the police could buy it legally, but know that they weren't allowed to use it. So, but we aren't. We are very far from a perfect world. Is that it? Thank you.